I'm Samantha and this is Lone Crow Adventures, the channel where we talk about all things camping, hiking, and backpacking. This weekend we're getting set up for a hot tenting weekend and it could potentially be one of the very last hot tenting trips that we go on before spring gets here. It's the first weekend in March and we're expecting to see a warming trend over the next few weeks, so we're going to make the most out of this trip. And here, it's time to go get her set up. So the hot tent that we're using is the Lux Hercules. I've used this tent uh, for the first time this season and I'm really, really happy with it. I really enjoy this tent. So this is the floor for the Hercules. Totally removable, has these little clips. It's really convenient because when you're hot tenting, a lot of times your floor will get really gross and muddy because uh, after a couple of days the snow melts and you walk around on top of the ground and it gets all muddy and worked up so it's nice to have that part it's a lot easier to clean than if it was connected to the tent I'm going to show you these shot quarter poles here got a couple of different colors we've got black ones which are the main poles that are used to maintain structure. And then we have these gray poles that are uh, to add additional stability. The biggest problem I have with this tent is the anchoring system. You have a metal stake that goes up through the bottom of these, and that will have a tendency to pop out. So that's kind of a pain. And when you're assembling it, these shock poles will come apart a lot. So you just have to be kind of careful while you're doing it. All right, so we've got the hot tent set up. There's just finishing up putting on the rain fly. Now, one of the things that you guys may or may not be aware of when you're setting up your hot tent is the placement of your flue pipe in terms of the wind directionality. The last few times that we've been out here, there has been like a two or three mile an hour wind. So that has not really been a consideration. Tonight, there is a fair amount of wind and tomorrow we're expecting gusts up to 20 miles an hour so we definitely needed to orient the stove jack of the tent which is right here behind us in a direction where when tomorrow the winds shift because today they're coming from 
a northeasterly direction. Tomorrow they're going to shift to a south-southwest direction. And when that happens, the smoke and the heat that's coming out of that flue pipe is going to be pulled away from the tent. A lot of times if you set up your flue pipe and it blows that smoke and that heat back onto the tent even though you have a spark arrestor if something escapes out of there it's going to go right toward your tent and you could burn holes in your rain fly or even worst case scenario burn down your whole tent so we have a slightly different orientation of the tent on this trip compared to trips that you've seen with us in the past so this is kind of what the tent looks like when you don't have the optional floor put into it so it's a nice big open space i like to use this floor inside of it and it just has these little buckles it has little buckles like this that just clip right in so you clip it in to each of the corners and then there's one of these tea ties here in the center part that this tea tie just goes through And then another buckle going all the way over into the next corner. So buckle, tea tie, buckle, tea tie, buckle, tea tie, and so on. All the way around the whole tent. So when I set up my hot tent, I like to use this is just like an all weather mat. Especially when there's snow. There's no snow on the ground this weekend, but when there's snow, definitely helpful to keep moisture out of the tent. The other thing that is totally necessary if you're using the clipped in floor is some type of a fireproof mat for you to set your stove on. I got this one on Amazon and it's a fiberglass based mat and totally fireproof up to 800 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. So will keep any of the heat that's coming from the stove from melting the floor and in case any coals fall out of the stove so keep it from melting your floor as well but when you're handling this fiberglass stuff my suggestion is for you to grab a pair of work gloves because just like when you touch insulation or something you're going to get very small particles of fiberglass in your skin so when you're directly touching the mat throw on a pair of gloves you'll so thank yourself for it later here it comes now, can you hold that for a moment? I'll try, but just be careful because if it disconnects, it'll thump on you. Okay, just hold her steady. It is a one gallon water receptacle and this goes on the back of the stove or you can hang it off the side of the stove and then it has a little spout here that you can have access to hot water. Definitely really nice. You get hot water a lot faster than boiling it. Alright, so we have the hot tent all set up. We have everything on the inside of the hot tent. Sarah's about to get fire going and we're going to get to cooking. Tonight we have something very special for dinner, known as Jackie's Meatloaf.
So you may be wondering why it's called Jackie's Meatloaf, considering that neither of us are named Jackie. Well, our good friend up in Michigan has this recipe. And when Sarah and I first got together, I used to make meatloaf and she would always complain that my meatloaf was crappy because it was a regular kind with the tomato sauce and the ketchup like everybody else makes and that her friend Jackie's meatloaf was the best meatloaf that she's ever had in her life. So I had to track down Jackie and get the recipe from her. And honestly, it is the best darn meatloaf that I have ever had in my whole life. And I will put a link in the description that talks about this meatloaf so that you guys can give it a whirl for yourself. It is a sauceless meatloaf. It requires no sauce. You'll see here in about 40 minutes. It's going to be good. Got this oven running pretty steady at 400 degrees by just propping open the oven about, oh, I'd say three quarters of an inch. Don't try this in your home. Do not heat your home this way. Do not heat your home <laughs> with your oven. That's what they do in Detroit. And a lot of people burn their houses down every year. <laughs> do not do this at home. Do not do this at home. But yeah, so we have it propped open because if I close it, especially if I latch it, this thing gets over 600 degrees and it's going to burn my precious meatloaf. So we've got it stationary about 400 degrees. It's been at 400 degrees for about 10, 15 minutes. It's not rising. It's not climbing. But you have to monitor the oven and reload the stove. I definitely recommend that you don't mess around with this front damper. Keep that one open uh, to the maximum position so that way you get good airflow so that the heat keeps coming up because you want the heat to come up this flue pipe to heat the oven. But if you need more heat, add more wood. If the stove, or sorry, if the oven gets too hot, just open the door until the needle drops down to the temperature that you need and then close it back up. And it does take a little bit of kind of learning how to use this oven. It's so different from a regular oven at home or even like a toaster oven. It's so different from that. But so far, so, you know, so good. I mean, that meatloaf, oh, it smells so good. This oven, one thing about it is that it is a kind of like you got to constantly babysit it. You have something in the oven, you can't just like, let me throw it in the oven and go do some chores around the hot tent. No, it's like you got to sit here and maybe, you know, drink a beverage. Um, for my nephew, this is not a beer. It's a root beer. And and you got to sit here and stare at this temperature. And I mean, you got to react to it constantly. So it's like I have a conversation. I stare at the oven. I like mess with the stove. I mess with the oven. But yeah, you walk away for like five minutes and you come back and it's 600 degrees and glowing, you know. So or... You open the door and you walk away for too long and then next thing you know it's 200 degrees and it takes 15 more minutes to heat back up. So it's definitely a constant, like you have to constantly nanny the um, oven. So that's one thing about it. But we're learning as we go. We're getting more proficient. We'll see if, uh, we'll see if Jackie's meatloaf can survive our learning. <laughs> I think I think these meatloaves are done. Let's see. A little crispy on the top, but they should be delicious. Oh. <laughs> My fingers are too fat. On the cooling rack. We got those potatoes, those are done. So we'll let these things cool off for a couple minutes and we're gonna plate it up. Oh, yeah! Oh, look at the steam coming off that meatloaf. Oh, yeah! It's really good, babe. Delicious. Compliment to the chef. Okay. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. Really, really good. So, special thanks to Jackie for the recipe for this meatloaf. If you guys want the basic rundown of what's in this, you've got smashed up club crackers, a couple of eggs, Lipton soup, mushroom onion soup mix, a can of mushrooms all cut up, an onion all cut up, and a little bit of garlic. You add all those stuff into the beef, mix it all together, and that's how you get Jackie's meatloaf. This meatloaf, you don't need sauce with. It's not not dry it's not flavorless it's delicious very moist and very tasty and very filling let's take a look at the temperature the outside temperature 28 degrees the indoor temperature inside of our hot tent 94 degrees we're pretty much sweating and dying <laughs> <laughs> so we've closed the damper on no the front of the stove and we'll get this heat under control these are real problems 66 degrees hotter inside in the winter oh hot tent problems <laughs> um, there's still pretty frozen uh, but we ball them up. We'll get enough to make some cookies. You gotta ball them up with yeah. your hands. We just smush them together like this. Mm. Put one there. Oh, I could just eat it right now. We could. And then another one here. It's de thawed a lot since we put it near the stove. Chocolate chunk. And this right here, folks, is another reason why you get so fat when you have to. <laughs> you can make cookies. You can make cookies. I don't know. Our stove is so hot. It's like jet fuel in there. So we'll see how the cookies fare. And you say, you're like, oh, we're going to bag up these cookies in our stomachs. Well, I don't think we'll eat two pounds of cookies. <laughs> you know, greater accomplishments in life have happened. We can do that. Okay, I think that'll be good because they'll expand and okay. I don't want them to. So only four cookies at a time. Okay. Oh my gosh, good. Oh, sorry. I'm not eating the cookie dough. Put the cookies in there. We'll put them in there for about ten minutes. And I'm just going to kind of. Yeah, leave it open. You know, close it like. You would mm -hmm. open a jar. So 10 minutes. We'll check them. Let's put some more on. Okay. Alright. Our cookies are done. Ooh la la. Oh no. One kissed the side of the oven. Uh oh. That one was against the side of the oven a little bit. That's alright though. Look at how golden brown they are. Perfect. I'll put them on the cooling rack. I'll have to make them a little smaller. That one kissed yeah, the oven. Yeah, that so was a little too big. Right. But those are the first cookies ever made in the Lone Crow oven. The second batch is going in. We're going to try to take the cookies off here. Put them on a little plate to kill. Hot tent cookies are exceptional.
All right, good morning, everybody. Nice day today. We got these windows vented fully. We've got some cinnamon rolls. Do you think they'll be okay for it at a time like this? Yeah, I would just go ahead and put them in two trays because when you go to frost them, you'll totally trash one of your trays. So you'll need the other tray to put in. Oh. When you frost them, it'll be everywhere. Yeah, that's true. And you true. should just remove the foil. You could stagger them a little if you wanted them. Yeah. yeah, so that way after we frost them one time, we'll just throw the foil, foil in the garbage. Away. Yep. That's right. Yeah, I would sp spread them out a little. Like the cookies were... You hold that for a second? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So you think kind of... Like, yeah, you kind of stagger them a little if you want. Kind of stagger them like this? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe. Like that. More room to frost them. Yeah, yeah. Give them a little more. A little more room to breathe. All right. Put these bad boys in. So it's getting that time in the day where I have to split some more wood in preparation for the stove. And this tool here has been a big, huge help. I can't believe what a big difference this thing makes. This is the S-Wing Fireside Friend. And what this is, this is a four pound wood splitting maul. This thing is fantastic. It doesn't have a sharp blade on it like an ax and it basically uses the force of inertia to come down and split the wood. And so far, I mean, this thing outperforms my hatchet in terms of just a pure wood splitting perspective, you know, hands down. I'm gonna put a link in the description below if you guys wanna check this thing out. I'll show it to you here in action in a few minutes, but this thing is fantastic. Now the other really nice thing about this tool is that you can come down and you can hit this sucker right into the dirt. You don't need to worry about the blade on it, so to speak, because it doesn't have a blade like an axe or a hatchet. With the axe or a hatchet, you always want to use some kind of a chopping post because you don't want to dull that blade by going through the dirt and hitting rocks and nicking edges and stuff. But with a splitting maul, it doesn't really matter if this thing goes into the dirt because it's kind of more just like a really heavy wedge. It actually isn't sharp at all. So you're not going to dull your blade by using it in this fashion. Whoa! Sound like a shotgun or something. Yeah. <laughs> Holy cow! Now with that being said, I mean this is a four pound tool so this is great for the hot tent. I'm not carrying this with me into the back country. My God. I may bring a, a hatchet with me on a backpacking trip. Only if I'm planning to cook over an open fire. A lot of this stuff is pretty small. But I like to go through it. Because the smaller that your wood is, um, the faster that you start to work up a coal base, 
the hotter your fire burns and the more fuel efficiency you actually have. Oh, I know what you guys are thinking. You're thinking, oh boy, there's Lone Crow putting that skinny little wood with a fancy tool. So I got a couple more formidable pieces here. Oh yeah. No problem. Now this one's going to be a little bit more challenging because it's kind of lopsided on one end. Do you want me to show you how that one's done? No, I'm good. Alright. Here we go. Pretty good for something that doesn't have a blade at all, right? Can I split it? Yep. Okay. No problem. Look at that. Now, we can get all this stuff burnt up in the stove. Alright, we've got some neighbors tonight. Let's check it out. So they've got a truck with a tent topper and then a big van and then a tent in it. That's one set of neighbors. And if we look way over here, we got another fella who's going to hammock camp it, hardcore soul. Oh, I've got the stove going, I've got the damper closed off. We're going to sleep great tonight. We'll see you guys in the morning. Well guys, thanks for coming on our hot tenting weekend adventure. Hopefully it's not going to be the last time that we get out there for the season. It's really nice today. It's like 60 degrees and beautiful. So I think spring is just around the corner. So hopefully we get at least one more opportunity to fire up the hot tent. If you haven't already done so, make sure you hit that subscribe button. There's great stuff on this channel. And since you're still hanging around, you may as well check out another video. Until next time, folks. We'll see you on the trail. Ah!